glad to see you're not retiring. So <laughs> I get tired just listening to some of his uh, all his ambition. That's awesome. He's going to be 120, and I'm going to be still getting stuff for him, him wanting me to do stuff. But yeah, you have not seen my proposed uh, organization chart. <laughs> Anyway, I love the vision. I, I really love the vision. I love how it's being connected to what was prophetically declared by Terry Bennett in July of uh, this year, in July of 2021, that God is raising up messengers and forerunners to trigger the bride being made ready. And this initiative is connected to that in the nations. And I love it. I, I just, I think it's incredible what God's doing. I want to encourage you, if you're listening to this message, if you want to help us raise money, let us know. Um, there's a massive need. And so anyway, just thank you so much for sharing that, Dad. And um, go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 19. And we're going to be talking, we're going to be continuing to talk about the message we talked about last Sunday about triggering the second coming of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to talk about a prophecy that is contained in the book of Revelation that's so very, very important. And for me, it's been something that has really shaped me for many years, but I, I want to invite you into this very same thing. I'm going to be talking about Revelation chapter 12 through 14. But I want to begin by getting the, you know, starting here with the end in mind that we get a big vision of where things are headed as we approach the second coming of Jesus Christ. And Revelation 19 verse 7 talks about, let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him for the marriage of the lamb has come. And his bride has made herself ready. I want you to see a big picture view of where everything is headed. Because this whole thing, things are being shaken up right now. And it's certainly like, okay, Lord, what's going on? What's going on in America? What's going on in the nations? What's happening in Australia? What's happening in Canada, in Germany, in Europe? Things are just... It's like, what's going on? And the Lord is moving in the nations. Even though, even though shaking is taking place, God is moving in the nations to make his bride ready. And I, I mean, if you don't get anything, hopefully you'll get more than this out of the message, but if you don't get anything else out of it, our mission as a church, as, a, as life school, as forerunner school, our mission is to see the bride made ready in the nations. It's to see Revelation 19, verse 7 fulfilled actually. And so what I'm going to be talking about is this scripture of how that takes place. Now, if you, I'm going to be, I've got notes here. There's um, about 18 pages of notes. I'm just looking to see any reactions, like 18 pages. I'm not going to go through all those today, but there's actually 19 pages. I'm going to talk some about next week. I'm, I'm definitely not going to go through all that today. <laughs> Trust me. I was waiting for, anyway, I won't say that. But anyway, 19 pages of notes. But I, I want to encourage you, over the next month, read through these. It's just so, so important. Um, I've been busy this week getting this together because I wanted to, you to have this. And so you can get the notes if you want to follow along in this message. You can get the notes on our YouTube link or you can go to RadicalPursuit.net for the title, Triggering the Second Coming Part 2, and you can get the, the notes. And so I want to encourage you to take some time to read Revelation chapter 12 through 14, even the kids. And I want to encourage you also to read the notes as we talk about triggering the second coming of Jesus Christ, that God in his sovereignty is not going to do it alone. We have this idea that there's this heavenly calendar that God's operating on, and he's sovereignly going to do everything, and the church has no role to participate in. 
and nothing could be further from the truth. You are called to be participators and not spectators at the end of the age. You are called to be participators and not spectators at the end of the age. He is, the Lord is inviting you to be part of his end time prophetic plan. And so if you have your notes on page one, I, I showed this chart how things are working, you know, how this, you know, what we talked about, God's raising up messengers and the messengers trigger the bride being made ready. And so we looked at this last Sunday, but I want us to see it again, that forerunners, and I, I, you see that chart there, page one, forerunners trigger the man-child being raised up. And I talked about that last Sunday, what that meant. It just means God is going to raise up a remnant within the church before the majority who have become conformed into the image of Jesus Christ, and they become the catalyst that activates end-time events. So I'm going to talk a lot about that over the next two weeks. And that catalyst of the man-child is going to then make the rest of the bride ready. So you have forerunners. You have the man-child, and you have the rest of the bride being made ready. Now, some people get confused. Does that mean the forerunners aren't part of the bride? Does that mean the man-child is not part of the bride? And the answer to that question is, is all of them are part of the bride. Forerunners are part of the man-child. Man-child's part of the bride. It just describes the function each has in making the bride ready. So, you know, just so hopefully that, that clarifies some of that for you. But last week we looked at how forerunners, how God is raising up forerunners to trigger the, the man-child being made ready. And I talked about my friend from the sixth grade, Bob, who had a full-grown beard in the sixth grade, six foot one. I came up to his shoulders and, you know, he graduated high school six foot one. But he was a man-child uh, in the sixth grade. And what I mean by man-child is I don't mean a mature man acting like a child. I mean uh, giving birth to this mature son that has been conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. It is Christ himself being formed in his people in the nations. That, that is uh, at stake here or in view here. So this week we're going to talk about the birth of the man-child. Next week we're going to talk about it as well. And so uh, to understand this whole thing, we've got to understand Revelation chapter 12 through 14. And just I want to give you a quick overview, just really quick, of why this is important. This is page two on the, in your notes. But Revelation, if you read the book of Revelation, and I want to encourage you to do so, because if you read this book, you will be blessed. If you want to be blessed by God, you read the book of Revelation. If you want to experience God's blessings coming into your spiritual life, read the book of Revelation. There is a promise straight from the Lord that if we will read and hear and obey the words of this prophecy, then we will be blessed. Okay? You don't have to be afraid of the book of Revelation. I'm telling you, when, I read, when, when you read the book of Revelation, you would think, I don't want to read it because I don't like the negativity that's in there. I think it's confusing. It's complicated. I don't want to hear the doom and the gloom. I'm telling you, here's what happens for me. You start reading it, and the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you, you, the last thing you feel is fear. You feel this incredible courage to realize, wow. I have been born for such a time as this. I have been allowed to be alive when these events seemingly are going to unfold. You were born for such a time as this. And so Revelation chapter 12 and 14 is kind of like you're reading through this revelation and you come and you put pause just like you would in a movie. You pause it on your controller, and it pauses the storyline that's in Revelation 11 and then in Revelation 15. It's a, what scholars call a parenthetical passage. Don't, that just means parentheses. It's like a pause in the storyline to give you another angle of how to look at this overall prophecy. It's like a prophecy within the prophecy. And Revelation chapter 12 through 14 is actually the key, I believe, to understanding the entire book of Revelation. 
I know when Noel, uh, Noel Mann, just uh, was like a spiritual father to me, whenever, one of the things we both did, just he did it and I did it, and we, I didn't know he did it, he didn't know I did it, but it's just something we did, it's just, um, I don't know, you might think it's odd, but I, we would always go into Christian bookstores, that's when we had Christian bookstores, I don't even know if you have Christian bookstores anymore, but you would go into these Christian bookstores and you'd pull out these commentaries on the book of Revelation. And the first thing I would do is, okay, turn to Revelation chapter 12. What do they believe about, uh, how do they interpret Revelation chapter 12? And he would do the same thing, I would do the same thing. I, I mean, I would always, it was like a weird hobby I had. Um, I don't really do that now, but it's a weird hobby I had where I would just get these commentaries and I just, I love to buy commentaries on the book of Revelation and I would read, okay, what do they say about Revelation 12? What do they say about Revelation 12? Because this passage is actually the master key that unlocks the mystery of this book. And so I want to just encourage you, don't shy away from this. Dig into Revelation chapter 12 through 14. And so um, that's kind of the idea. This Revelation 12 through 14, as you're going through the book of Revelation, there's a chronological flow to the book. And then all of a sudden you get to chapter 12 and pause. Pause. And the storyline that's going on is now expanded from Revelation 12 through 14, but from a different angle. And then when Revelation 14 is over, you unpause it and 15 through whatever, 19 flows in a chronological way. And so it is um, a prophecy within the prophecy that shines light into the uh, key events that activate the book of Revelation. I, I believe it is the key that unlocks the mystery of this book. And I would say it, I would go this far and say it like this. I have been studying the end time prophecy for over 25 years. I don't say that, you, uh, no way to brag. You're probably like, well, that wouldn't be bragging. That sounds like torture. So there's nothing bragging about saying that. I'm just saying to make this point is that um, in Revelation 12 through 14, I sincerely believe with great conviction that Revelation 12 through 14 is the most important unfulfilled prophecy in the Bible. So I believe that with strong conviction. It, 12, Revelation 12 through 14 is the most important unfulfilled prophecy in Scripture. And I'm going to explain why in a minute. But it's not only the most important in my mind, but it's also the most neglected, most perhaps most misinterpreted, and definitely one of the, le the most misunderstood passages of Scripture in the Bible, and in the book of, in the, especially in the book of Revelation. So I, that's why I spent 19 pages of notes, because I want you, it's just so important that we get a hold of this passage of Scripture, and we read it, and we hear it, and we study it, and we obey it. Amen. Okay, so... Because Revelation chapter 12 through 14, it really can, okay? So if you're going to read it and you're going to go like, what in earth is this about? This woman and she's pregnant with a man child and there's a seven-headed dragon with crowns on his head. This is so crazy. This is so weird. You're going you're gonna to read it and you're going to think, okay, what is this even talking about? Because it can be complicated, I want to try to simplify this for us. And I want to just ask the questions any forensic investigator would ask when they're trying to solve a mystery or a crime. So I want to ask, okay, why is this important? Who is this talking about? And when does this take place? Now, in this message, we're just going to talk about the why. We're not going to talk about the who or the when. So, but in this message, I want to talk about the why. Why is Revelation chapter 12 through 14 so important? So we're going to talk about that because I know you and me both, we're very busy. We're very, we got so much going on in our lives, so much going on in our world. We have just, you know, pressures here, pressures there, and we have so little time. Why should we invest the time to study Revelation 12 through 14? And so I want to answer that question in this message. Before I do, I definitely want to recommend one more time this book by Watchman Nee, uh, The Glorious Church. It is a blueprint for what God is doing at the end of the age. The Glorious Church by Watchman Nee, if you're not a reader, it's like 157 pages. 
You can get it in a PDF if you just search The Glorious Church by Watchman Nee, PDF, and you can get it for free. Highly want to recommend that you read that. So let's go ahead as we, as we get going here. Turn to Revelation chapter 12. And we're, we're asking the question, why? Why do I need to study this? Why do I need to care about this? Why do I need to spend the time to dig into Revelation chapter 12? I'm going to give you 10 reasons why. And before I give 10 reasons why, I just want to make one statement here. Is in Revelation chapter 12, 1 through 5, if, like I said, me and Noel, we would always go, okay, what's Revelation? What do they say about Revelation 12? What do they say about Revelation 12? Almost universally, any commentator who wrote or commentated on the book of Revelation, most of them would say Revelation 12, 1 through 5, is a historical description of Israel giving birth to Jesus Christ uh, and uh, 33 AD when he, or when, uh, when uh, birth giving birth to Jesus Christ, and then his ascension to the throne in 33 AD. That's what the majority of conservative scholars would uh, say. So that's what is in all the commentaries. But if you, if you look at many other men of God, many, I could, Watchman Nee, T. Austin Sparks, Gordon Lindsay, uh, uh, just other men of God that uh, have written about this subject, they have this second view, which is the view that I hold to, that the birth of the man-child is a prophecy of the overcomers, a remnant within the church who fully obeyed Jesus' words in Revelation 2 and 3. These will come to full maturity as a corporate son three and a half years before Jesus Christ returns. And this group is going to trigger key end-time events and will be the catalyst for the Lord's return. That's view number two. That's the view I hold to. That's the view I teach I know there is a massive amount that would go into the explanation of that. That's why I've got 19 pages of notes, because I'm sure you're going to have questions. If you've never studied this, you're going to have questions. It's a very, very deep subject. I'm trying to make it simple, but if you have questions, I, I would assume, I hope, most of them are going to be answered here in these notes. All right. So now, now we want to ask... Ten reasons why you should read or why Revelation chapter 12 through 14 is important to you, is important to the church. Number one, and I mentioned this a minute ago, you will be blessed if you study and read it. Do you want to be blessed? I'm not talking about prosperity, health, healing. Those are awesome blessings. But if you want to be spiritually blessed... God tells us, God promises us in Revelation chapter 1, verse 3, that blessed is the one who reads and those who hear and those who uh, obey, heed the words that are written in this prophecy because the time is near. Now, if the time was near 2,000 years ago, how much more today? See, I want to say just from personal experience, I have probably spent more time in my life studying Revelation chapter 12 through 14 than any other passage in the Bible. And I can say from personal experience, the, the, what it does to you spiritually, I don't know if there's anything quite like I've, I've experienced, to be honest, because what happens is you begin to get this vision of where things are headed uh, currently and headed as we approach the end of the age. And something happens when you get vision, when you see the end in mind, when you see the end goal, something begins to form within you and you begin to experience incredible spiritual blessings. I'm telling you, uh, it's a personal testimony. If you want to be spiritually blessed, if you feel as if my spiritual life has stagnated and I'm not progressing and I'm not advancing in the Lord, I I want to recommend to you Revelation chapter 12 through 14. I know it sounds such so paradoxical that you would read, okay, you're going to tell me to read about this things happening that are not very pleasant to hear about unfolding at the end of the age with a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and this antichrist rises up for 42 months and, and you know, all this stuff's going on. You're telling me that I can, I will read this and be blessed. It, it really does contradict the natural mind, but I'm telling you from personal experience, it does something 
I can't even really put into words in your spirit and in your heart when you get the big picture of how things are going to unfold at the end of the age. So I just want to encourage you, you will be blessed if you read and study Revelation 12 through 14. The second reason, the second reason we should study Revelation 12 through 14 is this is actually the culmination of the Genesis 3.15 prophecy, which is the first prophecy in Scripture. I want to invite you to turn to uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. It's the first prophecy in Scripture. And I'm sure you've read it, but if you want to understand the Bible and the narrative of the Bible, this prophecy is the outworking. This prophecy in Genesis 3.15 is really the thread that runs from Genesis to Revelation. Everything that unfolds in the Bible flows out of this first messianic prophecy that God gives after the fall. And he says... He says to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He will bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the hill. And so what we have here in Genesis 3.15 is the first messianic prophecy. Now, when you turn all the way to the book of Revelation, you see once again there is a woman, there is her seed, the man-child, and there is a serpent who has now morphed into a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns. What you see in Revelation chapter 12 is you see the culmination of Genesis 3.15 outworked in history and prophetically. What you also see here is this, this prophecy, Genesis 3.15, is fulfilled in three ways. Number one, it was fulfilled with Mary being the woman, Christ being the seed, and the serpent obviously being Satan, who was Satan bruised Jesus on the hill when he was crucified, but Christ, through his crucifixion, burial, resurrection, and ascension, crushed the serpent's head. Every work of darkness has now been disarmed because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And though Satan has now been disarmed, he has not yet been defeated because God has reserved that for us, the church, to do. Romans 16, 20, the God of peace will soon crush Satan underneath your feet. That's not just talking about you getting victory over the devil and your personal struggles. It's talking about a prophetic end-time scenario revealed in Revelation chapter 12 where God raises up a corporate group of overcomers who overcome and together corporately they enforce the final victory of the cross upon Satan and his angels and Satan and his angels are cast down from the second heaven down to the earth. God is raising up a group of people to see that that takes place. And you are invited into it. I'm invited into it. We are invited into it. It is an end time move of God he's now raising up. Paul said, we are ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete. That is what we see in Revelation chapter 12. So why is Revelation chapter 12 through 14 important? It's important because the first messianic prophecy in Scripture that has been running throughout Scripture in Genesis 3.15 culminates with the, the man child giving, uh, the woman giving birth to the man child, and the man child then triggering warfare in the heavens that where Michael and his angels defeat Satan and his angels, and, the, and they are cast down to the earth for the last three and a half years of this age. The third phase of Genesis 3.15 is when Jesus returns with his bride. When Jesus comes back, and the, and the angels of God are with him, and the bride is with him, riding on white horses. I'm talking about Revelation 19. We are coming back to bring the final enforcement of Genesis 3.15 upon the dragon to cast him into the uh, bottomless pit for a thousand years, to the Antichrist, 
and the false prophet and his regime, his, his eighth king, kingdom talked about in Revelation, that that evil, demonic, antichrist government was described by Daniel, that there's coming a stone, and that stone is Jesus Christ coming with his people that is going to smash the feet of the statue that Daniel saw, and, or Nebuchadnezzar saw in Daniel chapter 2, and the smashing of those toes are going to break the entire statue into pieces, and God's kingdom is going to be set up for a thousand years in which Christ and his people are going to rule and reign from Jerusalem. So that's the final phase of, of Genesis 3.15. So why study Revelation 12 through 14? Because it reveals the culmination of Genesis 3.15. Number three, why study this is because this passage of Scripture reveals how the bride is made ready. That whole passage of Scripture, at the heart of it, is how the bride is made ready. If you have a heart to see the bride made ready, if you have a heart to be the bride who makes herself ready, if you have a heart to be one of those forerunners who helps make the bride ready. Revelation 12 through 14 tells us this process of how that takes place. And seeing that process aligns our heart with what God wants to do. So why is it important? It shows us how the bride is made ready. I'll just quickly summarize this to make it really, really simple. The details are in the notes, okay? So if you go, okay, I need more of this, the notes, 19 pages, are in there. You can get all the details in there. But John is shown a vision. And in this vision, he sees a heavenly woman. Notice that this woman is in heaven. She's in heaven. She's clothed with the glory of the sun. The moon is under her feet. On her head is a crown of 12 stars. That crown, by the way, is the Greek word stephanos, which means the overcomer's crown. It's the overcomer's crown that's given in a, in a, in a game, signifying a mark of royalty or exalted rank. In other words, this crown that this woman's wearing, she's glorious, she has authority, and she's won the victory, is a corporate representation of the bride of Christ that have, has made herself ready throughout history and are now in heaven. And I've got all the details to explain that in the notes. I'm just saying it real quick here. So you already see the woman is in heaven and it's those who've already made themselves ready and have overcome. She's pregnant with a man-child who is to rule the nations with a rod of iron and this... this, this uh, man-child she gives birth to, and, and we, you can go through and look at the, the timings. It's in the notes. It's, it, we, you can find out when it takes place. It's about three and a half years before Jesus comes back. So you've already got those throughout history who have made themselves ready as the bride. You could think about Hebrews chapter 11, the great cloud of witnesses who obtained a testimony by their faith. You could think about people like Paul and the apostles and all those throughout church history who have really pursued this call to make themselves ready as the bride. They would all be comprising this heavenly woman who's pregnant. Now, the man-child would be those who are on earth who are saying yes to this invitation to be made ready. And just like the Holy Spirit worked in the womb of Mary to conceive and form Christ, the Holy Spirit is working and, and uh, shaping and molding in that remnant of people who are saying, yes, I want to be made ready. And in that womb of hiddenness, in that womb of seclusion, in that womb where no one else sees, the Spirit of God is shaping and forming and conforming a, a, a company of people into the image of Christ throughout the nation, scattered, a remnant of people, a hidden internal movement, and there's coming a time here at the end of the age when this woman gives birth to this man child who will rule the nations with a rod of iron. That's the, that's the second uh, phase. The third phase is then you see two aspects of the woman. She's on the earth now and she's fleeing into the wilderness the last three and a half years of the age, God is going to 
preserve some in the wilderness, and some also are going to be marked for martyrdom, the rest of her seed. So God is through the fires of the great tribulation. Daniel 12, verse 10, many, many will be made ready. Many will be pur uh, pur uh, purged, refined, made white in that time. And now I want to just draw your attention to the phrase many. The man child is a remnant. The many is going to be the greatest number of believers throughout history made ready at the end of the age. And I said this last Sunday, it is wisdom, wisdom to say, I want to be part of this man child. It's so much easier to be made ready now through the forerunners and messengers God raises up. It's so much easier to be made ready now than it's going to be then. I just wanted to say to you, if you're listening, I just want to say that, I just want to say, it's so much easier to be made ready now through the messengers than it is then. God's going to have a church made ready, but I'm just saying, just use wisdom. Just, you know, God is giving us grace to make ourselves ready now. Just cooperate with his grace. Amen? It's so much easier now than then, but God's going to do it. Number four, the fourth reason why we need, the fourth uh, reason why we need to understand the book of Revelation 12 through 14 is this reveals how God's purpose for the ages is fulfilled. What you see in Revelation chapter 12 is God's purpose for the ages fulfilled. And I wrote about this in the eternal blueprint is um, Paul's talking about the eternal purpose of God. He's talking about it in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 11 and if you actually break that down in the Greek, it means God's purpose for the ages. See, God has a purpose for every age. God has a purpose for every age. And the book goes through all the details of that. But God, and I, I, this is what I talked about in the book, is God's purpose for this age, which is the church age. We're coming into the kingdom age, but for the church age. God's purpose for the church age is to form a corporate man. Paul talked about that in Ephesians 4.13, that the fivefold ministers are meant to function to see that a mature man is raised up. A mature man, a corporate son, a, a, a son made up and comprised of, of many, many, many believers throughout the nations who've come into this place of Christ-like maturity by the indwelling Holy Spirit forming Christ in them internally, uh, spirit, soul, heart, and body. And so this purpose for the ages, this purpose for the ages is what is, on, I, I believe in my heart, it is at the very top of God's to-do list. It's at the very top of God's to-do list. So what we see here in Revelation chapter 12 is we see how God's ultimate intention, his purpose for the church age is fulfilled and accomplished. And so seeing how God's desire is fulfilled and accomplished does something in us to say, okay, I don't want to just live for my own selfish interest. I don't want to just be about me, myself, and I and what I can get from God. I want to actually be part of God's desire for what he wants to do prophetically. I talked about in the, the eternal blueprint that T. Austin Sparks said that we are in the school of sonship unto adoption. We are presently in this womb, so to speak, hidden, secluded, where God is doing an internal work where no one sees, the natural eye doesn't see, but Christ is on the move. The Spirit of God is on the move, forming Christ in his people. We are in that school of sonship unto adoption where we are being trained for reigning. 
We are being trained for reigning. God is, is training us for reigning. And that graduation from the school of sonship unto adoption is to the throne. When we graduate from that school of sonship unto adoption, it is to the throne. God is preparing. This, this, this is amazing. God is preparing a people who have been conformed into the image of Jesus Christ, and he's offering them rulership and partnership with him. You are destined for the throne. Okay, I may not have heard that. Your response, come on, does, it was, was lousy. I'm telling you, you are destined for the very throne of God. Thank you. You are destined for the throne of God. I'm not saying in your, in your, that you're, de is, you're destined, that is automatic. No, you've got to overcome. You've got to overcome as Jesus said. But that's God's desire for you. God's desire for, the, for his people is to give him, give them the throne. You are called to sit down on the Davidic throne, the very throne of David that Jesus sits on and will sit on in Jerusalem and have governmental authority in ruling the nations with a rod of iron. What an incredible invitation. I mean, I can't even fathom the invitation that God is giving his people to sit down with him on his throne and rule the nations with them. God's eternal purpose, God's purpose for the ages is to bring that about in a group of people called the man-child, the, the, the overcoming sons of God. Number five, this, the fifth reason why we need to read Revelation 12 through 14 is that reading it actually activates it internally within us. Paul talked about this principle in 2 Corinthians 3.18. It's the beholding is becoming principle. Beholding is becoming principle. Is when you behold, when you behold in Scripture, when you behold in Scripture, you actually become what you behold. There is a transformational work that God does when you see this in the Word. When you read, and I, I, I've seen this in my, own, in my own life, I would say reading Revelation chapter 12 through 14 over and over and over and over and over and over and over has done possibly more than anything else in my spiritual walk because of this factor. Beholding is becoming. Vision activates. Vision activates. Activate. So when you get a vision of what God wants to do and how God's going to do it and what is going to be accomplished, that vision actually sets off within you an internal work of transformation where reading it now places you at the center of that prophecy and you become part of the answer and the solution. It's not new age. It's very biblical. Beholding is becoming. Beholding is becoming. Spiritual sight, that spiritual vision. That's why Revelation 12 through 14 is so important is because God is unfolding to us a vision of how things are going to unfold and that vision sets off an internal work in us that begins to shape us and mold us to where we now are no longer just reading something in a book. We've now taken on an active role in the prophecy. That's incredible. That's why I'm just saying, just camp out there and, and really get into the scriptures and just meditate and study and say, oh, Holy Spirit, I don't understand everything in here, but just, just teach me, Lord. Teach me your word. Show me your word. Number six is this reveals God's blueprint for prayer and intercession. Very vital. 
What God wants to do in making the bride ready is not going to come without prayer and intercession. There's a reason why a, a red dragon with seven heads and ten horns is waiting to devour the birth of this man-child. Satan wants to stop the bride being made ready at all costs. The greatest warfare you will ever experience is not surrounded around uh, getting people saved, getting people healed, seeing miracles flow, you know, seeing the kingdom of God advance. The number one threat the enemy is threatened by is the bride coming forth in readiness. And if you are experiencing spiritual warfare related to this, don't be discouraged, but be encouraged because you know you're on the right track. The devil wants to stop this man-child from being born. The devil wants to hinder this from being born. Thus, the, the great need for us to join together in prayer and intercession to give birth to this man-child in the earth. Vital. It is not going to happen apart from the laboring and the, the, the toil of intercessors who get the vision of God and become pregnant with the vision of God and they begin through birthing prayer to give birth to God's ultimate intention. If you read Revelation, you see in Revelation 5.8 that before the Lamb breaks the seals and opens the scroll, before he breaks the seals and opens the scroll, which basically means activates what's in the book of Revelation, there are golden bowls filled with incense. These, this incense is the prayers of the saints. So what we see in Revelation chapter 12, we know from Revelation 5.8, that is activated by the prayers of the saints praying for the bride to be made ready. This is not, these prayers of the saints are not some random prayer for Aunt Sally's cat to be healed. They are specific. I don't like cats anyway. I don't want them to die, but I mean, anyway. I don't know where that came from. But anyway, these are, these are not these random prayers we're praying, Lord, show me what to make for dinner. I mean, you know, thank God Angie does that because it means the food's better. But these are not random prayers. These are not random. These are very specific and Dad calls it the golden altar prayers. He's going to teach a whole class about it that's so timely, so important. I believe the most important thing God's calling us to be is a house of prayer that gives birth to this man-child through prayer and intercession to see Christ formed into people. Remember, Paul said to the Galatians, I am in travail. I am, in, I am, in tra I am laboring and in travail for Christ to be formed in you. Oh, that there might be prayer warriors and intercessors who get a hold of the vision of God in Revelation 12 through 14 and come together with Paul's burden and say, oh, church throughout the nations, I am in labor and in prayer to give birth to Christ formed in you. It's going to take prayer and intercession unlike we have ever seen because of the warfare surrounding this vision for it to be fulfilled. So the, reading Revelation 12 through 14 is like fuel added to the fire for corporate prayer and intercession. It is the blueprint of how to pray. Okay, how do we pray? What do we pray for? Revelation 12 through 14 shows us pray for that birthing of the man-child in the nations. Number seven. Number seven is this passage reveals the trigger that activates many end time prophecies. Every prophecy written about the last three and a half years of the age, everything related to the day of the Lord, the book of Daniel and how it culminates, every single one of those end time prophecies require this one trigger. And without that trigger, those prophecies will not be activated. They do not just become activated by the sovereignty of God 
alone based upon a heavenly prophetic calendar that says this is a the time, therefore, is going to happen. These, this, these, this pro these prophecies are triggered by something, and that trigger then activates all these other end-time prophecies. That's why I say Revelation 12 through 14 is the most important passage of Scripture, unfulfilled prophecy. Uh, most important unfulfilled prophecy, say it that way, is this passage reveals what triggers the casting down of Satan and his angels from the second heaven. That doesn't just happen random, randomly. It doesn't just say, okay, now's the time, go to war, Michael and his angels. Something has happened. The birth of the man-child takes place. Then that triggers the casting down of Satan and his angels. This passage reveals the trigger for the great tribulation and the Antichrist, his 42-month 40 reign. This passage reveals the trigger for the bride made ready through fire and testing. This passage reveals the trigger for the complete transition from this present church age to the kingdom age when the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. This passage reveals the trigger for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Jesus is not just going to come randomly without something taking place, and that is revealed in Revelation 12 through 14. The eighth reason why we should study Revelation 12 through 14 is this passage reveals how the kingdom of God comes in fullness. And when I talk about coming in fullness, I mean with the king himself coming. A lot of the church today wants the kingdom of God to come, but they don't really want the king to come. They want the kingdom to come so they can have blessed, uh, blessed pocketbooks, blessed money, blessed influence. But when the king comes, it's going to put an end to much of their business. They want the kingdom to come without the king to come. But I'm talking about the kingdom of God coming when the king comes and reigns from Jerusalem. So Revelation chapter 11 says, Now the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of his Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever and ever. The kingdoms of this world are going to come under the lordship of Jesus Christ as king of kings and lord of lords. And he's coming back and he's going to return to Jerusalem and he's going to rule the nations for a thousand years from uh, Mount Zion in Jerusalem. And the nations will stream to him and seek him for wisdom and guidance. And every single bit, bit of evil will be eradicated from this planet. And Jesus and his church, his bride, will reign with him. But Revelation chapter 12, Revelation chapter 11 tells us what? The kingdom of God's coming. Revelation chapter 12 tells us how it comes. I got this from Watchman Nee's book, so just want to give him the credit for that. He's probably looking down at heaven, cheering me on. High five. Just kidding. Revelation chapter 12 tells us how this takes place. Look at what it says in verse 10. Now... The kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. Now the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. Why? Verse 11, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life even unto death. For this reason, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and to the sea, because the devil has come down to you with great wrath. See, the kingdom of God comes when the kingdom of God has been formed internally within a people. And Christ has been formed within a people. And those people have come into this place of conformity into the image of Jesus Christ and have become mature sons of God. That's how the kingdom of God comes. When that happens in a remnant of God's people throughout the earth, here at the end of the age, 
that will then bring about now the kingdom of God has come and then it will bring about the trigger for the kingdom of God coming to the nations in fullness with the second coming of Jesus Christ. Number nine, the ninth reason why we should study Revelation chapter 12 through 14 is this passage reveals the catalyst for the end time birth pains. You recall, this is a very popular uh, passage of scripture in Matthew 24, verse 8, when the Lord began to list out all these different things, and he says, these are the beginning of birth pains. Well, if there's birth pains, that means there is a birth, right? The only place where you see a birth, I think, related to the end times is in Revelation chapter 12. So what this tells us then is we can look at the birth pains to see that a birth is coming and is imminent. Because the birth, the birthing of this man-child is a hidden internal work that is scattered throughout the nations, but the birth pains are felt in every nation through shakings, through upheavals, through uh, earthquakes, persecution, pestilence, like the coronavirus, nation rising against nation, racial wars, conflict, offense, lawlessness increasing, betrayal, the love of many growing cold, deception. I mean, are we not seeing that unlike anything we've ever seen in our lifetime? Since 2020, have, has, not, has the birth pains not increased substantially? That tells me that tells me something is about to happen. See, Satan does not trigger the end times. God does. God triggers the end times. What God does triggers the end times. What God is, the, the move of God that's taking place triggers the end times. And so what we see is the natural reaction from the powers of darkness who are panicking, seeing that there is now a, a conception and formation in the womb of the church. God's people are coming into a maturity. God's people, even in a, even in a remnant, are coming into a maturity, coming into a formation, coming into a Christ-likeness that now is going to give birth and is causing the enemy and the powers of darkness to tremble and to become nervous. Therefore, the upheaval in the nations. Therefore, the tyranny and the lawlessness and all the crazy things we're seeing take place is because Satan knows God's on the move. Satan knows God's on the move. So what we should do when we see this is realize and not, you know, our natural tendency is to go, oh, dear God, the end time's coming. I would say, no, dear God, you are on the move. Your ultimate intention is about to be accomplished. Your eternal purpose is about to be fulfilled. Hallelujah. We are moving into that time when the, when the marriage supper of the Lamb is coming. God is on the move. See, Jesus is not coming back until the bride's made ready. But as the bride is being made ready, and I believe we're at the beginning of it. I believe we're at the beginning of it. I think it's probably going to take a decade or longer to work itself out in the nations. But I believe we're at the beginning of it, and the enemy sees that. The enemy sees that. What's going on in America? What's going on in Australia? What's going on in Germany? What's going on in Canada where freedoms are being taken away and lawlessness is increasing and cancel culture is rising up and offense has gone to a whole new level? Betrayal is increasing and love is growing cold. The enemy sees it and the Lord says those are birth pains signifying something is about to be born, revelation Chapter 12, verse 5, and the woman gave birth to a man-child who was to rule the nations with a rod of iron. We are moving into the fulfillment of that end-time prophecy. Praise God. You are born for such a time as this. You are destined for this very hour and moment and have been prepared for this very time. 
Praise God that God has marked you to be part and numbered you to be part of this company of people. Now, you obviously have a choice in that. You can choose it or reject it. But I believe that we're seeing, when I look at these birth pains taking place in the nations, I believe that's telling me this prophecy is close to being fulfilled. I think we got at least 10 more years, longer perhaps. I don't know. I'm not setting time. I'm just saying God's on the move based on Revelation chapter 12. See, watch me talked about in the glorious church when God wants to make a dispensational move, meaning when God wants to transition us from this present church age to the kingdom age, God raises up overcomers. Most of the church has failed. Most of the church has failed. Most of the church has become lukewarm, apathetic, indifferent, lost their first love, entangled in the world and everyday affairs. Most of the church has become entangled in that and God has to raise up overcomers. And he's raising up overcomers because God wants to make a dispensational move to transition us from the present church age into the kingdom age. You are invited. I am invited. We are invited. This ministry exists for this very reason to be a catalyst ministry that helps see this come forth in the nations. What an honor it is. What an incredible honor it is. Number 10 is, we need to, we need to read this, study it, is because, and I've kind of hit at it, but you're invited to participate in this and experience it. You are invited. Listen, listen, listen. You are invited. You are invited to be a participator and not a spectator in end time events. You are invited to be part of this man child that God's raising up, this company of overcomers who overcome by the word of their testimony and by the blood of the Lamb, and they don't love their life, their self life, their soul life, even unto death. It means that they're no longer living for themselves, by themselves, but they're living by the indwelling life of Jesus Christ. That's what God's doing. That's what God's raising up, is he's raising up a company of forerunners to give birth to the man-child, and you are called to be part of this. And when you say yes to this invitation... God will take you and he will put you, allegorically speaking, into a womb, a place of isolation, a place of seclusion, a place of intimacy. It's called the secret place of the Most High God. And in that secret place of the Most High God, God will shape you, God will form you, not by might, not by power, but by his spirit. And the very spirit of God who impregnated the Virgin Mary and formed in her Christ Jesus, the Messiah, will come into you, into your spirit, and impregnate you with this very life. And he will move from your spirit into your heart, into your soul, and form Christ in you. You are meant to be conformed into the image of Christ, and it is the Holy Spirit, just like he did Mary, who will come and shape and form and mold you into that very image so that you, along with however many, I'm just going to say a million, two million, whatever the number is, I don't know, around the nations who are saying yes to this invitation, become this man-child scattered throughout the nations that God is giving birth to this this mature man, this corporate son who graduates from the school of sonship unto adoption to God's throne. All creation is groaning and longing for the revealing of the sons of God. There is a groan in creation. There is a groan in creation. You can feel the groan in creation. 
Creation is longing. Creation knows that what's taking place is not right. What ta- the lawlessness, the tyranny, the evil, the wickedness, the bloodshed, the perversion, all that's taking place, something's not right. Creation is responding with upheavals, earthquakes, all this different shaking in the natural. Creation knows that that the sons of God are coming forth and creation itself is longing for that because it's the sons of God who is going to restore creation, this earth, to what it was intended to be when Jesus comes back. And I'm just going to close with this. You're invited to be part of this. I am invited to be part of this. Will you say yes to the invitation so the Spirit of God will come and form Christ in you in fullness into his pattern image that you would be numbered among those who have come into the conformed image of Jesus Christ with all those around the world who said yes to the invitation? Amen. Let's just, let me just pray real quick. Even online, we'll pray. If you want to be part of that invitation, I just want to invite you to stand. Even if you're online watching, just stand. I really believe this is an invitation God's giving us. So this is an invitation. Oh, the kindness of God. (laughs) The kindness of God. This is a global movement all around the nations. But it's going to be a a movement that is going to be primarily in a remnant. It's not going to be the whole church. It's going to be in a remnant. And so if you feel as if God's even doing a separation with some of those in the church, don't get nervous, all right? God is going to divide those who want to go on, the the wise virgins, from those who are the foolish virgins. There is a division the Lord is bringing in his church with those who want to go on, with those who want to stay in their complacency. Though all are invited, not all are going to respond. And so if you are hungry to say, yes, I want to be part of this work of God, this movement of God that is being raised up, just just hold your hands up to the Lord. I include myself in this. Father, we pray, Lord, for all that are listening in person and online. Father, we just say yes. Lord, it is not a lukewarm yes. Come on, let's not make it a lukewarm yes. Give it a passionate yes. Give it a yes. yes. With everything that's in you, Lord, we want this. This is why we this is why we live. This is the very reason we live, your eternal purpose. We want this, Lord. Have your way. Amen. Lord, have your way. Put us on that molding of the potter and mold us however you will and however you want to be that clay molded into the image of Jesus Christ. We are, Lord, we with all of our hearts say yes to the invitation. Yes to the invitation. We want to be that man child who will rule the nations and be caught up to God into his throne at the end of the age. Lord, we want to be that those overcomers that trigger all that you want to do at the end of the age. Yes, Lord. Whatever you must do internally, Whatever you must do within our heart and in our soul, we say yes to that, Lord. We say, come, Lord Jesus, come. Just like you did in Mary where the Holy Spirit came and overshadowed her and the power of the Most High overshadowed her and impregnated her, would you cause even a conception to take place even from our spirit to begin to activate, Lord, your end time move of the Holy Spirit to form Christ within a company of people. Lord, would you move right now to begin to form Jesus Christ in your people? Lord, would you begin with those who are hungry 
to form Christ within us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the hunger in your remnant. And we say, yes, Lord. Amen. Amen. We're going to end the online part. Thank you so much for joining us online. Um, we are still here locally, or got more to do, so don't leave quite yet. Um, I want us to respond. I, I know it's kind of been a tradition in our church to respond when God gives an invitation by singing, Yes, Lord, we will ride with you. So, Larry, would you mind leading us in that song? Is that okay? <laughs> Maybe give him the microphone and then. Um, it's just something we've done for just years. Do when it. God has given an invitation, is, 